When we last spoke in March, you said that to really get a grip on coronavirus, we need to be testing virtually everybody. Four months on, how do you think we're doing? We're doing infinitely better than we were. Uh, we're testing many, many more people, but I still don't think we've got the right strategy in place for what I would call mass testing. And, you know, if you think our capacity is 300,000 tests a day, we're probably only utilising on our calculations around about half of that. We'll soon have 500,000 tests a day capacity. We should be using all of it, and that means extending greatly the numbers of people who've got access to tests and using the data and local communities much more effectively in doing it. And the reason why I still think we're short of where we need to be is that I think if you, if you analyse what we know about this disease now um, and look at the global data, the reality is we're going to be living with COVID-19. We're not going to be eliminating it. What, forever? Well, for the foreseeable future, for enough of the future that means that it's worth putting in place the containment infrastructure that allows you to control it. Because the, the, the problem is that if you just look in the last few days, OK, you've had surges of cases in Poland, Australia, Romania, Israel, Argentina, you know, several other countries. So there's, there's a pattern developing, which is that people go into lockdown, they ease the lockdown, but then there are significant spikes. And we're still in the summer months when it's frankly easier to, to, to deal with the disease. So do you anticipate a significant spike here as we leave lockdown? There is a possibility you end up with a resurgence in the autumn. Now, it may not happen, but you've got to hope for the best and plan for the worst. And so what we do in the paper we've put up from the Institute is suggest a whole range of things that you could do now that would allow you to put in place that containment inf infrastructure. One of the other things that you recommend very uh, strongly is the use of face coverings, much greater use of face coverings. Would you say the government's messaging on face coverings has been clear, consistent? Uh, no, no, I think they're even, even the most ardent supporter of the government wouldn't say that. I mean, they began by saying they weren't necessary. I think we said two or three months ago, it was obvious you were going to go in the direction of masks. There are certain things that are just obvious when you look at them. And the evidence on masks, by the way, is absolutely clear globally. There's no doubt they help control the disease. If you look at the countries that have used masks extensively, and not just the, um, the Asian countries where it's more of the normal culture, but take a country like Austria, where they've used masks extensively, there's no doubt they've been able better to control the disease. And it's all about controlling it because if you, if you think that you can't really go back into lockdown as we were in, in, say, March and April, and I think it's just unrealistic to think we're going to be able to do that. Why not? Because I think the economic consequences, even from the lockdown we've had, are so severe. If you go back into another lockdown, I mean, I'm already you know, horrified by the potential economic damage, uh, even from the lockdown we've done and the loss of confidence. You go back into a another big lockdown, no, I, I, think, I think it would be devastating uh, for the economy. So I think, put it like this, you can't rule out doing it, but it, it's going to have to be a, a terrible situation. So the likelihood is that you're going to have spikes, you might have a resurgence, and you're going to have to control it because you won't be able to go back into the kind of nuclear option of lockdown. So if that's the case, just prepare now, use the month of August and September to put in place the best infrastructure you possibly can. So for example, employers, you know, already many employers and a lot of people in the occupational health management um, companies are helping employers test their employees. Because if you're going back into the workspace, you'd like to know what the disease status is of the people that you're working with. We should be making this much more widely available. We should be coordinating it. You've got to mobilise local communities. You've got to use all the lab capacity that you have. And then one of the other things that we say in this report, which I think is hugely important globally, is develop rapid on-the-spot testing, not just for antibody testing as to whether you've got the disease. We have some of those already, but antigen testing to see whether you have it. If it's so important now to prepare for uh, you know, the autumn, the winter, testing, uh, you've spoken a lot about uh, face coverings too, how unhelpful is it when you see government ministers going into pret manger or Wagamama without wearing the masks? Yeah, they, they've got to try and, you know, put it out there as much as possible and communicate by, by what they do. And there's, there's no, look, no one likes to wear a, a face mask, but 
It's just, you, when you look at the evidence, there really isn't any doubt about it at all. It's a significant inhibiting factor on the spread of the disease and therefore you've got to use it. Okay. Uh, now, the long-awaited report into Russia uh, was uh, published this week. Uh, it said the UK government badly underestimated the threat from Russia and has been playing catch-up. Do you think we've taken our eye off the ball here? Well, whether we've taken our eye off the ball or just decided not, not to put our eye on it is, is an interesting question. But look, going forward, what's very clear is you should build the capability to, and we, we've got this, I mean, we're still with one of the best security services in the world. Um, you've got to build the capability to investigate what foreign governments are trying to do in interfering with our system um, and expose it. And the more you expose it, the less it will be effective or the less it will happen. And we, we live in a new world today where cybersecurity is going to be a massive, massive question for governments. And, you know, there are governments who want to weaken the West. Uh, we know, you know, basically why they want to do it. You've just got to make sure that they're they're all the time constrained. You say there that you aren't sure if the government took its eye off the ball or decided not to, to look at the ball. It felt like you were referring perhaps to the uh, EU referendum, to the, thought, to the uh, suggestion uh, that no invest effort was made to investigate whether Russia tried to interfere in that referendum. Yeah. You, you, can in, you can investigate it without believing that, you know, the reason we got Brexit... Look, I'm anti-Brexit, as you know, but I don't believe... We know that, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, but I don't believe <laughs> That's that come through. the referendum result was because of Russian interference. That, that would be foolish in my view. But, but you should know, and, and the government should investigate for the future at any rate. Let's... So there should be an investigation, you think? Well, I think it would be sensible to investigate what has happened, but really the most important thing is to create the capacity for the future to make sure that, that you know what's going on in your, in your democratic politics. Because this, this interference, and, and it's only one aspect of cyber security, by the way, um, this interference is going to be, it's going to be more and more widespread because the capabilities are much greater. I mean, when I was in office, social media was just beginning. You know, now you've, you've, you, you've got a whole industry out there, um, both that can do these types of attacks or campaigns of disinformation and those who can protect you against it. Although, of course, on Brexit, you know, the, the government does say it hasn't seen any evidence of successful interference. Even you say that it would be foolish to say yeah, that. Yeah, no, I mean, look, be, I, you know, you've got to keep these things in their context. But the fact is, you, you should protect your country and you should, if someone's interfering with your democratic process, you, you want to know about it. On Brexit, uh, briefly, do you think we'll do a trade deal by the end of the year or are we heading to no deal? I don't know, because they obviously could land a deal. I mean, actually, we did a paper last week showing how you could land a deal. But by the way, even the deal we land is going to be pretty bad, because essentially it's going to, even the deal the government's wanting, is essentially going to be good for Europe because it's going to allow easier trade in goods, where Europe's got a big surplus with the UK, but it's going to be very inhibiting for us on the issue of services where we've got a massive surplus with the EU. Yeah, we know, we know the arguments that have been rehearsed yeah, yeah, no, I mean, but it's, many times or, yeah. on it. Um, do you think Number 10's relaxed about the prospect of no deal? No, I don't think they'll be relaxed about it if they're, if they're sensible because the, if you've got coronavirus and, then you, and all the economic dislocation that's caused and you put a no-deal Brexit on top of that and then you've now got issues to do with China um, and Chinese investment, so you'd stack all these things up. No, I, I should imagine they will want to try and get a deal, and let's hope they do. On China, um, because it does feel as if that is one of the biggest foreign policy uh, issues uh, at the minute. You know, you've said that they have serious questions to ask, answer over coronavirus. We've seen some of the human rights things that are happening in Hong Kong with the Uyghurs. Do we need to have a more muscular relationship with China? Well, I would put it like this. We need to have a strategy for dealing with China. It, it's the problem that you have you have it to a lesser degree with Russia, you have it to a much bigger degree with China, is it, China is one of, effectively, you might say it's one of the two superpowers of the world today, America and China. And the difference with the old Soviet Union days is that China, which is why the Cold War analogy, in my view, is misleading, is that China is absolutely integrated into the world economy. So we've received billions and billions of pounds worth of Chinese investment into our country. We have more, I think I'm right in saying we have more Chinese students come to British universities than the whole of the European Union put together. So we have to put up with their wrongdoing? No, no, you don't have to put up with your wrongdoings. But what, 
and you have to confront them where it's necessary to confront them but you have to do it from a strategic position where you're also saying to the Chinese government and the Chinese people very importantly because the Chinese Communist Party is not the same as the Chinese people we want to keep ties we want to keep um, open for investment that's of a proper nature and that doesn't put our security at risk and we want to make sure that the cultural exchange that we have, for example, Chinese students coming to British universities, um, uh, that is maintained. So what I'm saying is, don't, you know, and our position, by the way, will be different from that of America in some of these respects, because America's America, right? We, we are going to be in a position, therefore, where, yes, there's a space for confrontation, there will be a space for competition. There's got to be some space left for cooperation. You see, um, you know, when you say it's a kind of a strategic position, I can't help thinking if you know, that sounds like a, a great thing. But if you strip it back, you're effectively asking to have your cake and eat it. Is it really realistic to say, look, we could have this you know, close relationship with China, but also call them out where necessary? When, if you look, you know, for example, the Chinese government has said the UK must bear the consequences for interfering in Hong Kong. On Huawei, the Chinese ambassador said, you can't have a golden era if you treat China as the enemy. I mean, you've been prime minister. You know it's about difficult decisions. We can't just have our cake and eat it. Um, you can't have your cake and eat it, but you can engage with China in a way that keeps lines of communication open and and then in the end it's up to them if they want to say as a result of us going with america on the huawei decision which is essential for us in the end because you know if america and our key allies are all lined up on the one side our security is so linked to that of the united states we're so bound to america in so many different ways around security questions that you were bound to go with them on huawei it's going to be up to the chinese government if they then want to say okay in that case we're not we're not having chinese investment in the uk but so far as we're concerned, we should be saying, no, we're open to investment, provided it's investment that doesn't put our security at risk. And we're open to ties of cultural exchange. And for example, when it comes to some of the health questions, climate change questions, we will remain in, you know, in, in dialogue with you. And so, hope that they continue the dialogue effectively. And then, then it's up to them to decide what they want to do. What I'm saying is we shouldn't be in a position where we suddenly switch into hostility that encompasses not just the activities of the Chinese leadership, whether it's on the Uyghurs, Hong Kong, uh, whatever it is around security, we shouldn't, we shouldn't switch from a, a position where we're confronting on that to saying, well, in that case, we want to go into a decoupling where we, we're essentially back in a Cold War situation with China, because the risks of that long term are that you, you end up in a situation where you're alienated not from the Chinese Communist Party, but from the Chinese people. Um, I'm keen to talk to you as well about Scotland. Uh, now, before the EU referendum happened, you said, in my opinion, if the UK votes to leave the EU, Scotland will vote to leave the United Kingdom. Do you still think that's going to happen? Well, I think it's a, it's a possibility. Yeah. I mean, what, what, what I was saying back then a is... A strong you... possibility? Huh? A strong possibility? Well, it's, it's hard to judge. Look, I don't think it's in the interest of Scotland to leave the UK. Um, because the ties, economic ties, cultural ties, everything is so, so strong. But of course, Brexit, particularly if it is a hard Brexit, adds an additional dimension. And then I think the, the, the problem has been, you know, my view about Scotland is there's been two problems really over the last decade. Um, the first obviously was after Brexit, but then even before that, because the Labour Party went off in a, in my view, completely the wrong direction in Scotland, um, and the Conservative Party, at least until Ruth Davidson, looked as if they were nowhere. There was no proper opposition to the SNP. Now, I think if the Labour Party, as it's reviving uh, in, in England and Wales, revived also in Scotland, that would be, that would be a significant advantage to you, preserving the union. Do you feel that Boris Johnson is a disadvantage to preparing the union? If you look at the latest polling from YouGov, for example, 67% of Scots think the Prime Minister is doing badly. Yeah, well, it's obviously, you know, he's not going to be the person who's going to save the union in that sense. Um, but you do need a viable opposition in Scotland, and they've not really had one. And as I say, the problem when, when the Labour Party went off to the left and then played around with nationalist sentiment, instead of being clearly in the centre-left position and strongly in favour of the union, it lost its purchase um, as the opposition. And then 
you know, other than that period of time when Ruth Davison was leading the Tories, there was no one who was really able to provide a, a coherent alternative to Nicola Sturgeon and the SNP. It's pretty clear that you're much more comfortable with the idea of Keir Starmer leading the Labour Party than Jeremy Corbyn. Have you talked to him much? Uh, yeah, no, I talk to him from time to time, and as I'm sure he does with the uh, other former Labour leaders, and I think he's done a, a great job. I mean, he's really... You know, he's made the Labour Party competitive again. There's still a long way to go on policy, but, you know, he's, he's made a, a, a really impressive start. And I think he's, he's got to a situation where, for a lot of people who had really given up on the Labour Party, voters, as it were, I think they're now looking at it again much more sympathetically and they regard him as a serious figure. You said that there's still a long way to go on policy. What, what policies do you mean? Well, I think it's... I, I don't mean that it's just about... I don't think the last manifesto was very sensible, but I think the, the big challenge that we're going to have as a country coming out of coronavirus and being out of the European Union is how do we, how do we, make, how do we make the country's economy strong for the future? Now, I believe that the technology revolution that we're living through is the single most important thing for politicians to grapple with. Um, and I think if Britain plays its cards right, it can become a significant force in that area. But it's going to require massive change in the way government works, in the way business works. And whether it's the Labour Party or indeed this government, you're going to have to do this in circumstances where, if you're not careful, the coronavirus, Brexit and that technology revolution are going to create an even bigger social divide and even more inequality. So there's a big challenge and task for the Labour Party. So I'm just saying it's going to have to confront that task and overcome it and weave the, these changes into a narrative of optimism about the future. Wealth taxes? Well, it's got to look at, it, it's got to look at what, what you might raise taxes for. And I think, you know, there may be inevitably some increase in tax as a result of the big deficit we're going to run. But my experience with tax when you're in the Labour Party is be really careful because, by the way, the public out there aren't, you know, they're not sitting there worried as to whether you're going to raise taxes or not. They're probably worried that you are going to raise taxes. So you're just going to be mindful of that concern. But secondly, it's also going to mean that you drive better value through your public services and through what government does. Because I, I don't think it's not sensible just to spend the money you know, you, if you take our National Health Service, for example, I mean, we can all be great supporters of it, but we should treat it as if it's a great sort of living organism and not a kind of monument where you just put money into it and don't ask questions about, you know, how efficiently is it operating? How can you make changes for the future? How can, for example, you embrace technology more fully? So, you know, there's a, there is a, a policy agenda out there that is what I call radical but sensible. And that's where the Labour Party's got to go to. And I think it's, you know, there's much more talent on the front bench now. And Keir is obviously, as I say, he's, he's a sensible, serious guy. And, you know, we've got the time to get it right. Just finally, whenever I interview, I always get the sense that you just can't wrench yourself away from politics. You know, you're always publishing reports on coronavirus or coming up with arguments on Brexit. Um, I just wonder if people think, why, after 10 years as Prime Minister, are you still trying to be so involved in politics? Isn't it time to, you know, take some time out, go around the golf course, go to the shepherd's hut? Um, it's not something I want to do. Look, a lot of people might think, yeah, that's exactly what he should do and stop, you know, talking about things. But I care about the country. I think we're at a huge moment of change in the world. And, you know, the institute that, that I've built, which has got now almost 300 people working for it, we do work here, but we also do it around the world. And, you know, it's, look, it's going to become... I've tried to do something that previous prime ministers have not done, but in the future, I predict that many more will try and do, because you leave office, you know, when you've still got a lot of years um, of active working life, and when, you know, your experience, you do learn a lot, and therefore, if you're motivated and you, you, you want to have a sense of purpose in life, then... You know, if you, if you feel you can make a contribution, you should. And then I, I always say to people, you don't want to listen. <laughs> it's free world, don't bother. But, but I'm not, I'm not going to be playing rounds of golf and, you know, sitting at home twiddling my thumbs 
That's not going to happen ever.